Good morning uh, to everyone. As as, uh, as Tom said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the status of uh, combined heat and power in the United States, but focus mainly on, on, I think, the question on a lot of people's mind is where does CHP fit in as the economy uh, heads towards decarbonization? Uh, uh, Jesse, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone on this call understands what CHP is, but, but uh, I know sometimes the decks get passed around and things, so I want to just put this slide in here. You know, CHP is just a more efficient uh, way of providing power and, and thermal energy to a site than uh, a, you know, a separate boiler and, and grid generation. You know, have a, a turbine or an engine at your site uh, generating the power you need. Uh, and recovering the thermal energy from that to, for space heating, for process heating, uh, for cooling, dehumidification. And in that higher efficiency, it generally uh, reduces operating costs, uh, obviously depending on power costs and, and fuel costs, uh, but it can also uh, significantly increase energy reliability, energy resilience at a site, and reduce emissions overall since you're, you're using uh, less fuel. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a little background on, uh, uh, I need to move the, uh, some of the boxes out of the way. There we go. Uh, uh, CHP uh, today in the United States, not, not sure where the title went, uh, but CHP increases, uh, uh, there's 81.6 gigawatts of existing CHP at more than 4,700 facilities in the U.S. right now. Uh, and those eight, almost 82 gigawatts save approximately 1.3 quads of fuel uh, and 215 uh, million tons of CO2 annually. 82% uh, of this existing CHP is in industrial applications, but we do see a lot of growth in terms of the number of systems and starting to see in, number, in capacity in, uh, in institutional, commercial, and, and non-industrial uh, ap applications. Uh, the, uh, the CHP that is out there, and I'll cover this in a little bit of detail because I think this is important, it uh, uses a variety of fuels, both fossil and renewable. Right now, 72% of existing uh, CHP is natural gas fueled, and that's, that's really uh, because of the historic availability of natural gas, the uh, clean burning uh, uh, characteristics of natural gas, the affordability of natural gas, and it has been the fuel of choice for a lot of industrial and commercial applications for a long time. Uh, but you'll see that 15% of the existing capacity of CHP uses non-fossil uh, uh, non fuels, uh, not natural gas or coal or, or oil. Uh, and I think that's an important point. And, and, uh, and the use of, of uh, non-fossil uh, uh, fuel for CHP is increasing. We see that in recent uh, uh, you know, advances in, in the market. And, and, and talking about uh, growing advance, uh, advances in or how the market is developing, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's shifting a little bit. We see a lot of growing activity for CHP in non-traditional CHP markets, light industrial, commercial, uh, institutional. In fact, over the last 10 years, based on the number of applications, multifamily sector has been the, uh, the most active uh, market for uh, for CHP, not in terms of capacity, but in terms of number of systems uh, that have that have gone in. And in fact, uh, this non-traditional CHP markets have represented 85% uh, of the installs of the, the last 10 years, but only about 30, 35% of the capacity. So you, you can you know you can see it's a very different market than the large industrial CHP market uh, uh, that that is traditionally CHP. Uh, we also see a real driver uh, in many of these, uh, both traditional and non-traditional CHP markets uh, for critical infrastructure, for resilience and, and critical in infrastructure, industrial uh, operations and microgrids. And that, that does seem to be a growing uh, market driver for CHP. Uh, unfortunately, it's one that's tough to uh, monetize when you're when you're doing a project uh, a balance sheet, but it but it does seem to be driving the market. Uh, but uh, quite frankly, and I think this is part of uh, why we're talking about this today. I think we all recognize that CHP is facing some some headwinds right now. Uh, the fact that uh, seventy two percent of it is based on natural gas. The fact that in some sections of the country we're seeing uh, moratoriums on, on gas infrastructure uh, expansion. We're seeing uh, uh, cities and and, uh, and and counties putting up uh, bans on 
on new natural gas connections. Uh, you know, what is the future of, uh, of CHP uh, when one of its major fuel is, is really uh, not looked at favorably as we move forward for uh, decarbonization? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, great. So, uh, so, the, so before I get into sort of the potential role of, uh, of, of uh, CHP and decarbonization, just wanted to share just some thoughts on a high level uh, about, uh, about uh, decarbonization. Uh, first of all, you know, the, the, the administration has set goals, a carbon-free power sector by 2035, a net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, it there that's a pretty aggressive uh, approach uh, and I think part of that is understanding that to get there reducing carbon today is important so uh, options and technologies that we have that, that uh, stop carbon going into the air uh, today are, are still uh, valuable and trying to get to uh, car you know net zero carbon by 2050 but getting to that that uh, that that uh, 2050 goal and even 2035 goal uh, is going to re require a historic transformation. And I think there are a lot of uncertainties uh, in that approach. Uh, what's the cost of new generation, uh, renewable generation, uh, and T&D going to be? How much is needed? What's the cost of storage? Uh, what about industrial processes that are difficult to electrify or very expensive to electrify? There, there are billions, I guess trillions of uh, dollars of uh, industrial uh, assets out there that uh, that uh, if you go down the full electrification path are going to need uh, first of all new technologies to address uh, and then significant amount of money and, and uh, uh, you know and and uh, uh, asset dollars that, uh, to 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 move along on that uh, you also have critical facilities that will need dispatchable onsite power for long duration resilience and reliability what's the best way to do that as you move forward. Uh, with uh, you know with, with decarbonization uh, and and I think even when you have a highly renewable grid you're still going to need some sort of dispatchable firm generation for support uh, for regulation of the of the uh, of the grid for uh, 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 you know enabling uh, the, you know the the vari uh, variable uh, generation to, to operate most efficiently uh, and then, you know, again, what is the path to decarbonization? Is it full electrification? Is it uh, multiple paths that, that uh, uh, you know, support one another? Uh, what we've seen at many of the states, there's co commitments to decarbonize, but often not really under, underpinned with, uh, with concrete plants. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty out there. And what we see is, uh, you know, more recently, and I think we're behind Europe and, and maybe Japan in this, uh, there is an increasing look at renewable fuels, at net zero uh, fuels, uh, re renewable natural gas, hydrogen, uh, being part of the solution, potentially being used to uh, to uh, decarbonize, uh, you know, uh, industrial processes to decarbonize critical facilities, and that's where I think CHP uh, starts to fit in. So the next slide, please. Is uh, what well, one? There we go. And so I'm going to start with uh, sort of a, my conclusions of, of of CHP and decarbonization. I'll start out with that, and then sort of go for each of these points uh, with some with some backup slides. You know, uh, first of all, as I said before, CHP is fuels flexible. It currently uses a host of renewable fuels, uh, low carbon waste fuels, and hydrogen uh, where available. And uh, you'll see that all the major gas turbine engine manufacturers are enabling their equipment to run on higher levels of, of hydrogen, higher levels of biogas, a better cleanup for biogas you know, in the future. Uh, I think it's also important to, to note that CHP is the most efficient way to generate power and thermal energy. And because of that, it's always going to be at an advantage to a combustion technology, whether that combustion technology to generate power uh, is is uh, 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 based on fossil fuels or based on renewable fuels, that efficiency, the higher efficiency of CHP is going to be of value, uh, both in terms of cost uh, reduction and in terms of emissions uh, reductions. Uh, net zero fuel CHP, again, uh, we think can uh, be the decarbonization answer for thermal end uses in industrial and commercial facilities that are going to be difficult to electrify or too expensive. 
uh, these net zero uh, fuel CHP can uh, decarbonize critical facilities again that need uh, dispatchable long duration on site power for resilience and operational reliability. And the high, again, back to the high efficiency. If, uh, if uh, renewable natural gas, hydrogen uh, end up being a viable path, one of the paths to uh, decarbonization, they're going to be, at, certainly in the beginning, expensive and, and scarce. And the high efficiency of, of CHP can extend the supply of these renewable resources uh, in, you know, uh, as, as they enter the market. Uh, and then finally, I think there is a, a role for uh, CHP at an industrial site or a commercial facility institution uh, to provide dispatchable uh, net zero carbon generation and regulation support to, to you know, enhance the, the resource adequacy of a highly renewable grid. Uh, and in doing so, have another revenue stream for the user uh, to support that CHP system. So again, I'm going to go through most of these uh, pieces with a little bit of data. The next slide, please, Jesse. Uh, first, uh, CHP is fuel flexible. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because we, we've I've already talked a little bit about that. But again, currently, 15% uh, of existing uh, CH capa CHP capacity is fueled by non-fossil uh, fuels. You can see that on the uh, pie chart on the, on the left. Uh, process waste, biomass, biogas, uh, like that. 12% is renewable, bio, biomass, wood, biogas, LFG, uh, life, uh, landfill gas, waste heat, and other renewable. Uh, but note that this 15% of non-fossil capacity represents almost 25% of the number of CHP installations that, that are out there. So there's a large track record uh, an experience base for CHP operating on renewable and other non-fossil fuels by both industrial users and suppliers. And I think one of the reasons you don't see more of this is that certainly the gas, uh, the availability and low price of gas, uh, and there really hasn't been a focus uh, to date of, of, uh, uh, of, of really uh, implementing uh, some of the resources, the, the renewable and, and uh, non-carbon resources that are out there. I think that's changing as we go forward. I just want to note that when you look at biogas and landfill gas, there's 613 CHP systems out there of the total 4,729 4, that operate on those. So there is an enormous experience base by both suppliers and users uh, with, uh, with, with non-fossil fuels. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the efficiency of, uh, of CHP and particularly in uh, comparison to marginal generation that's, that's on, on the grid. And I'm doing that because, uh, uh, and, and I'll get into this uh, as well, but I think most people understand that when you put in a CHP system, when you put in energy efficiency project, when you put in a, a site-based uh, 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 renewable energy pro project, uh, it's it's uh, the marginal uh, grid generation that is displaced. It's not the average grid generation, but it's a, it's the, the generation that's on the margin in most areas of the country today. It's it's a fossil fuel combination of natural gas uh, and coal. But when you when you talk about marginal generation, you can see that CHP has a higher net uh, efficiency. And this uh, chart compares the net electrical efficiency. I want to make sure I, I describe this right. And that's based on the power output divided by the fuel input chargeable to power. So if you're a CHP system, you've got a total fuel uh, consumption, you would subtract the fuel that would normally go to the boiler producing the steam that the CHP system is producing. And what you're left with is an efficiency based on that, uh, that net uh, fuel going to electricity uh, dividing into the electricity produced. And you can see, uh, for this is for a variety of uh, CHP systems ranging from a 7.5 20 megawatt gas turbine uh, down to a micro turbine, down to one megawatt recip engine and uh, 100 kilowatt recip engine in the blue bars to the left, compared to state-of-the-art natural gas uh, 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 marginal generation, which could be a a 100 megawatt combined cycle power plant or a 10 megawatt Wurzela, you know, large uh, medium speed engine that you see being put in, in many places in, uh, in, in Midwest. And I also want to point out that these efficiencies on the uh, yellow bars, the marginal generation, include the T&D losses because one megawatt hour of 
CHP produce on site uh, reduces the grid generation, uh, the, you know, generation back at the natural gas combined cycle power plant by one megawatt plus the T&D losses. So that's also a part of the efficiency of, uh, of CHP. And that efficiency generates, you know, translates into lower net uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, next slide, please, Jesse. And this is, again, those same CHP systems in blue to the left compared to uh, the uh, uh, natural gas state-of-the-art marginal generation. And, uh, and these numbers are the uh, effective CO2 emissions in terms of pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour generated, uh, assuming, again, a displaced boiler efficiency of 80% for the thermal uh, energy. And you can see that all the CHP systems uh, have a, a lower uh, effective with CO2 emissions in terms of pounds per megawatt hour compared to state-of-the-art marginal generation. And when you consider that, uh, again, today, most areas of the country, their marginal generation is not just based on state-of-the-art natural gas combined cycle, but uh, some of its combined cycle, some of its coal plants, some of its uh, 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 single cycle uh, gas turbine peaker plants. Uh, and in many cases, the displaced uh, uh, generation marginal generation is, is up into 1500 to 1800 pounds per megawatt hour. Uh, so there's some significant advantages to, to natural gas CHP today uh, compared to the mar marginal generation that, that's in the country. Uh, next slide. And I want to spend a little bit of time on the marginal generation because uh, we, we have found that to be uh, confusing uh, with, with some folks when they think about this. Uh, and uh, uh, the World Resources Institute, uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and EPA all recognize two frameworks for reporting greenhouse gas emissions tied to a site's electricity consumption. Uh, there is an inventory, inventory accounting framework, which is I, I often called attributional, and that's where an organization or a site, uh, a site's in. Uh, uh, it's it's an inventory of, of uh, emissions at a site. And when you're estimating the uh, site's uh, uh, emissions for grid electric consumption in that inventory, uh, you usually base that on an average grid emissions factor. But if you're looking at a individual project or a program that is promoting energy efficiency projects or CHP projects or renewable energy projects, uh, all these organizations recommend that you should go to a project with our consequential accounting framework that estimates the changes in direct emissions on the grid as a consequence of that energy project. And that's based on marginal grid emissions factors. And, and uh, I should have put the URLs, but, but off to the right are the documents from, uh, you know, the greenhouse gas protocols from EPA uh, that give this guidance that says when you're looking at a CHP project and you want to uh, 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 you know, estimate what that those emissions benefits are from putting that project in. You should base that uh, calculation of uh, on marginal grid emissions for the the grid emissions that are displaced by the on-site generation uh, for that project. And you know, there are different ways to estimate the marginal grid emissions. You know, uh, you, you know, you could get a dispatch model and all that. Uh, but EPA has developed two tools to estimate those marginal emissions. One is the uh, avoided emissions and generation tool, AVERT, uh, that has regional grid, uh, 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 displaced grid, uh, uh, marginal grid em emissions, and also uh, the non-base load emissions rates from EPA's uh, eGrid model also has that. And to just give you a sense, uh, in 2019 data, the AVERT national uh, marginal emissions factor, the national for the U.S. was 1,550 pounds per megawatt hour on a regional basis, it ranged anywhere from, I think, 850 up to about 1900. And again, uh, you saw, remember those marginal uh, gas generation uh, numbers were on the order of, I, I believe, 800 uh, uh, pounds of CO2 per, per megawatt hour. And the CHP systems were all 600 uh, pounds and below. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, so I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but again, this is in, in the slide deck for you to look at. But I do want to show you how CHP provides uh, both energy and CO2 emissions 
savings today, and that's natural gas CHP. So we've uh, we've analyzed uh, and put together some graphics on on a 20 megawatt gas turbine CHP system, sort of a typical industrial application, natural gas fuel, 90% uh, load factor, so it's you know operating about 7,900 hours a year. Uh, you can see the electric efficiency and the steam output. Uh, this probably has an overall efficiency of just a little over 72% for the CHP system. Uh, and it displaces, uh, the thermal energy displaces an 80% 80, 80 efficient natural gas boiler. So you can sort of see the, uh, you know, on, on the left of this graphic here, you, you, you see the separate heat and power uh, producing the amount of electricity and thermal energy that would come from this 20 megawatt uh, CHP system operating at, you know, 7,900 hours a year. Uh, you can see the amount of fuel going into the 80% boiler, the amount of fuel going into the the uh, great electricity, including T and D losses and the tons per year uh, emissions and the amount of fluid fuel going in the combined uh, heat and power and the tons per emissions. And you can see that the total efficiency of separate heat and power is 53%. The total efficiency of combined heat and power is 70%. Uh, percent. Uh, and the energy savings is, uh, you know, a pretty significant number. And I'll show you this in comparison uh, to uh, uh, to, to some other uh, um, options as well. Uh, and the CO2 savings uh, is, 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 is quite significant. And the CO2 savings are based on the, uh, the avert uniform EE uh, average, national average, which I mentioned on the last slide, which was 1,550 pounds of CO2 per, uh, per megawatt hour. Uh, so this just gives you a, a, a sense of where uh, the CO2 emissions are coming from and the savings and the energy and the savings are. And if you go to the next slide, please, uh, this, this now compares that industrial natural gas CHP system, that 20 megawatt system, to 20 megawatts of utility. Uh, well, first of all, let me move over uh, two, uh, two uh, columns over. Uh, 20 megawatts of utility solar PV and 20 megawatts of utility wind PV. Uh, in between is uh, is a biogas, a 20 megawatt biogas gas turbine CHP system. And you can see uh, uh, on the, uh, the the third column down that the annual capacity factor for natural gas CHP is it's 90 percent, 90 percent for biogas. Uh, I'll use na national averages. Uh, for utility solar PV of 24% uh, uh, annual capacity factor and 34% for utility wind. And what that translates into is, uh, you know, on an annual basis, much more electricity is generated from the natural gas and biogas CHP than from PV and wind. Uh, and plus thermal is an output of each. Uh, and and uh, that translates into larger annual energy savings and C annual CO2 savings that are on the order of same order of these renewable technologies. And yes, the natural gas CHP does have CHP emissions uh, tagged to it, 600, uh, anywhere from 400 to 600 uh, pounds of CO2 per uh, megawatt hour uh, tagged to it. Uh, but the fact that you're generating so much more power in, in, uh, in, in a year compared to what you're getting out of the PV and the wind, it's still generating some significant CO2 savings and, and, you know, and not putting that in the, in the atmosphere. So CHP's high efficiency, high annual capacity factor results in significant annual energy and emission savings today based on natural gas CHP. You can see how large those uh, savings are if it was biogas CHP, which uh, you, at this point, we're going to assume is, is technically uh, zero carbon uh, output. Uh, and, uh, and these CHP advantages, these efficiency advantages will continue if and when the gas infrastructure decarbonizes. So, I, you know, again, I think you're seeing there's a story here. There's a path here where CHP put in today does not get stranded uh, if, if uh, uh, you know, if renewable natural gas, if hydrogen comes along and increased use of digester gas or uh, gasified uh, biomass comes along. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is for a specific site uh, down in the southeast that uh, that our friends from Sterling Energy uh, analyze. And, and again, this is based on a 20 uh, megawatt natural gas uh, fired gas turbine uh, CHP system. 
uh, and uh, it, it shows the uh, the uh, it compares the annual CO2 reductions from that 20 megawatts of CHP to 20 megawatts of utility wind and PV over the 35 year period based on the servicing utilities long term resources plan. Now, this admittedly, this resource plan did not have the utility going down to zero carbon by 2050. Uh, in fact, you can see down in the lower left, it had the, uh, the, the marginal generation in years one to four it was mainly coal, uh, five to 11, it was uh, kind of a mix of coal and, uh, and natural gas, and then uh, pretty much natural gas, uh, state of the art natural gas after, after that. But it is, it does, just shows, again, reiterates the fact that natural gas put in today uh, saves an enormous amount of CO2, natural gas CHP, in most areas of the country and will continue to save uh, CO2 as long as the marginal generation is a fossil fuel. I think that's 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 pretty clear. And uh, next slide, please. And in, in a lot of areas of the country, that that long term generation, at least uh, I think through you know, 2035 is going to be on that mar marginal generation is going to be fossil fuel in a lot of areas. Now, this uh, is these two charts are from a study that uh, ICF did for the Energy Solutions Center, and I think it was done back in 2019. Uh, and what they did was uh, was look at the uh, uh, natural gas CHP, uh, very similar to what I showed on the slides before. In, in these regions, uh, these egrid regions uh, in the in the in the U.S., uh, and uh, looked at, at how each of those regions, at least uh, uh, based on their existing plans at the time for decarbonization or for re, uh, renewable uh, goals and and for carbon reduction goals, uh, they modeled what that marginal generation would likely be uh, in in each of those regions over time. Uh, and compared that to the, you know, the, uh, the, the continued use of natural gas CHP in each of those regions over time. And you can see that the green means that there were significant reductions uh, with CHP. Uh, there, it, there are reductions in almost all uh, areas of the country in that timeline from 20 to 2035 on the left, uh, except for New York, which has set very, very near term and strict goals on, on, uh, on carbon emissions on the grid. And even in uh, on the right from 2035 to 2050, uh, natural gas CHP in that, this evaluation can continue to uh, produce uh, CO2 uh, savings compared to that marginal generation or uh, on the grid in, in all areas except for New York and California, which again have set specific uh, zero carbon goals. And, and you can see also in, uh, in New England, which is, which is very close to zero carbon setting a goal. Uh, the timing on, on when CHP, natural gas CHP, didn't make sense anymore all changed, but, but I think it's safe to say that over the next 10 or so years, uh, natural gas CHP in most areas in the country will continue to save uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, and be an important part of the, of the solution to decarbonization. Uh, next slide, please. This is, you know, this is sort of a cartoonish uh, approach just to, to just to show that uh, the, uh, you know, how natural gas CHP might fit into a grid that's uh, uh, completely uh, carbon free by 2035. Uh, it, you know, the, the X axis is today to over to 2035 on the right. The Y axis is that marginal emissions rate. And you can see in today it's, it's pegged at the 2019 avert 1550. Uh, we just drew a straight line down to zero for 2035. Uh, and if you, again, look at a, uh, uh, a large uh, CHP uh, system, I think this one uh, is a little bit uh, less efficient than the one I had showed before uh, that, that produces uh, 710 pounds of me pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour on natural gas. Uh, that CHP system still uh, continues uh, to save uh, emissions compared to the grid for 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 a long way on the path to 2035. Uh, once the uh, marginal emissions rate of the grid gets below that 710, uh, if you started uh, mixing uh, the natural gas going in the CHP system with renewable natural gas or with hydrogen, uh, you could you could see how you could keep up 
uh, with the uh, with the declining emissions on the grid and keep CHP uh, more more effective at, re at reducing carbon all the way to 2035. Again, assuming that those fuels, those zero carbon fuels, net zero carbon fuels will be out there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, CHP, again, if the fuels are out there, has the ability to uh, to uh, save carbon. Uh, what are some of the fuels out there? Well, there's a lot of talk about renewable natural gas. Renewable natural gas uh, can be made up of landfill gas, uh, wastewater, uh, uh, biogas from wastewater treatment facilities. This is a chart that shows the carbon intensity of some of the resources for renewable natural gas compared to natural gas and diesel. And I, I just wanted to point out that some of the sources, uh, animal manure, food, uh, uh, digestive gas from food and green waste, actually have a net uh, CO2 benefit because you're taking methane that, uh, out of the air that in that process that is wasted or is, is exhausted uh, over time by some of these, uh, some of these uh, resources. Next slide. Uh, and the next question is, you know, what's the potential for this renewable natural gas, spe specifically uh, for, for CHP? Uh, AGA looked at this with a study by American Gas Association, by ICF, back in 2019 uh, or 2020. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the, the resources that they use, forest residue on the, on the right, uh, food waste, uh, things like that. Uh, and they, uh, they did a technical resource potential, a high resource, and a low resource. Uh, and their high resource potential uh, by, uh, by uh, 2040 uh, came up to be 4.5 uh, uh, TCF. And this was cost competitive with other emission reduction strategies that were 55 to $300 a ton of reductions. Uh, but what's interesting is that 4.5 TCS represents about 60% of current industrial natural gas use. So there's, uh, you know, at least in, in, uh, in this analysis, there's, there's a significant potential for RNG uh, that could be developed. And I've seen newer studies that, that are on the same order of magnitude. Uh, next slide, please. But I think the real, uh, the, you know, the, the real answer over time is, is hydrogen, whether that's green hydrogen from renewable or blue hydrogen from natural gas with uh, carbon uh, sequestration. Uh, I, I, I think uh, there's a lot of work in Europe. There's starting to be a lot of work uh, in the U.S. thinking about this. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's going to require system changes. Uh, hydrogen uh, has a much uh, uh, less is much less dense, so to, to deliver the same energy content, uh, three times the volume flow. It it has a uh, a different flame flame speed, so uh, and a higher flame temperature. So with flame speed, you're going to have to change. So uh, on the volume, it means uh, it, uh, modifications to manifolds on gas turbines, to manifolds on engines. Obviously, modifications in the distribution system uh, on a combustion system. Uh, the higher flame speed means modifications uh, to combustion hardware and the fact that hydrogen has a higher flame temperature uh, you're going to have to worry about NOx and also have to have uh, modifications on the combustor for that and emissions after treatment but from a use in a gas turbine or a uh, recip engine or a micro turbine all these uh, issues are really manageable with engineering and are well underway next slide uh, and, and, and just to talk about some of those things, uh, right now uh, in, the, in the system, gas engine systems that are in market, most can do 10 to 20 uh, percent hydrogen blend without any problems. 2G Energy uh, is actually uh, offering uh, engine CHP systems that go up to 40 percent engine uh, hydrogen blends, and all recip engine manufacturers are working on 100 percent uh, hydrogen capability in our engines by 2030. Uh, the same with uh, with gas turbines. There's a long history of gas turbines operating on hydrogen. Uh, there are uh, systems out there now operating on 100% hydrogen. And again, all the major gas turbine manufacturers are targeting 2030 to introduce 100% hydrogen uh, systems into markets like the CHP market. Uh, Micro turbines are in that uh, in that uh, that sort of same. Uh, boat and uh, and you know fuel cells operate on on hydrogen to begin with. So uh, the prime movers, the CHP prime movers, will be ready. And just as an example, on that two G forty percent 
an engine that can do 40% hydrogen now, uh, they envision a, a, a field modification to get those engines to 100% available again uh, in a later part of the, the 2020s. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the one question that always comes up, uh, sure you can do it technically, what's the cost of hydrogen going to be? And, and I don't think anyone, anyone knows. Uh, all I wanted to do was point out uh, that current costs of hydrogen uh, from renewable resources is about $5 a, a kilogram in the US. DOE has a target to bring it down to $1 a, kilo, a kilogram. And I didn't put this in the dollars per BTU. I should have, I should have done that. Uh, and, uh, and this summer, DOE, DOE announced, and I think with the Infrastructure Act, there's a lot more funding and support going into uh, developing hydrogen uh, production and hydrogen delivery approaches uh, to, to, to get this into uh, the market for decarbonization. Uh, in fact, the next slide is, is an example of that. Uh, you know, after cost, one of the questions is, what's the availability of hydrogen? And I think most people are looking at uh, where is hydrogen produced today? Uh, who could use it close to those, uh, those uh, areas? And then how do you expand it from that? This is one example. This is a study that was put out by Great Plains Institute just last week that identified 14 uh, hubs of, uh, of uh, significant industrial use, use, existing hydrogen production and ammonia production, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, 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 geolo geological uh, places to store carbon to come up with 14 uh, carbon hydrogen hubs uh, that you could see this sort of hydrogen economy develop, uh, hydrogen distribution systems develop, and uh, and you know, and large from there uh, as as the costs go down and the experience base goes up. So there is a lot of work on this. There's been a lot of thought on on hydrogen use in in Europe, and I think we in the U.S. are just beginning to see that it could be an important part of uh, the decarb solution. Next slide. So I'm going to end uh, the talk about decarb with just this. Uh, again, getting to a low net zero carbon future. Uh, is, uh, is going to be a historic uh, transformation. Uh, DOE is focused on transitioning CHP to biomass, renewable natural gas, and hydrogen, and trying to help that in both R&D and in both deployment. Uh, and I think that, again, as I said before, the, you know, the opportunities are uh, decarbonizing energy intensive sectors that rely on thermal energy, uh, uh, helping uh, resilience and renewable on the grid and at sites. Uh, and uh, really, uh, maybe providing some new revenue models for users through supporting supporting the grid. Uh, Tom, I probably went a little. Uh, next slide, please. I, I just wanted to, to point out the uh, CHP uh, deployment program at DOE. There are ten regional CHP application centers uh, that are uh, work uh, you know feet on the ground to work with users to do CHP screenings and work with states to understand where the barriers are. Uh, there is a program to uh, focus on packaged CHP systems, uh, which reduce uh, the cost and the risk to users and vendors uh, out there. And there's a whole slew of marketing resource, uh, resources and tools out there that, uh, that are being worked on. And I think we ought to go to questions and there are additional slides that have details on each of these things that'll be in the, in, in the, uh, in the pack.